the sex steroid hormones, which include testosterone and estrogen, which of course are present in varying ratios, but in both men and women and in kids, they are manufactured from cholesterol. We hear about cholesterol as this terrible thing, but they are actually made from cholesterol. And so if you don't get sufficient levels of cholesterol, that can be problematic for your hormones and that can be problematic for your brain and your body health. We've all been taught to avoid foods high in cholesterol. And while limiting our intake of this substance is important, it's not entirely correct to demonize it. Cholesterol is actually a type of steroid belonging to the class of lipids, and it plays an important role in several bodily functions. While it's true that excessive cholesterol can be harmful, it's important to recognize that our bodies need a certain amount of this substance to function properly. In fact, some studies have suggested that low cholesterol levels may be linked to an increased risk of depression and other mental health conditions. For example, did you know cholesterol is involved in the production of estrogen and testosterone? This hormone is crucial for both men and women, contributing to muscle mass, bone density, and sex drive. So while it's important to be mindful of our cholesterol intake, we shouldn't view the substance as entirely bad for our health when carefully optimized. Volume is important and you can't overdo it. Along the lines of hormones and testosterone, I get a lot of questions about this, I think, because a lot of online communities are sort of obsessed with testosterone. And I just want to emphasize that, yes, having sufficient levels of testosterone is vitally important for brain function and having sufficient levels of estrogen will allow your brain to actually function. It turns out that estrogen is one of the main ways in which the brain maintains longevity and maintains its ability to think. So we should all be seeking optimal testosterone levels for ourselves, both testosterone and estrogen. Maintaining optimal levels of testosterone and estrogen is crucial for brain function. And there are numerous foods out there that serve as a good source of cholesterol and small fatty acids that can support metabolism. However, it's important to not overdo it. Hormone optimization is a common topic in online communities. Still, it's important to understand the importance of testosterone and estrogen and other factors that can positively affect our cholesterol levels, such as sunlight, exercise, and fasting. It's important to seek optimal levels of both hormones for oneself. While estrogen is essential for maintaining brain function, testosterone has a similar effect. Testosterone can exert its various functions only in its unbound form, free testosterone. We all make a particular binding protein called sex hormone binding globulin that essentially binds up testosterone, prevents it from being free. This sounds like a terrible thing, but actually it's a good thing because it allows testosterone to be transported to the various tissues, including the brain, where it can exert its various functions. Testosterone is critical in sexual development, muscle growth, bone health, and mood regulation. However, its effect can be altered by age, health status, and environmental factors. It's important to note that having too little or insufficient testosterone levels or too much sex hormone, binding globulin in the body has adverse effects and should be corrected. But how? Let's hear from the perspective of a neuroscientist. Lower than desired levels of testosterone or too much sex hormone binding globulin, it turns out that 400 milligrams per day of something called Tongat Ali, which is a form of ginseng, can actually help increase levels of free testosterone. Many people experience a positive subjective effect and some objective effects as well, meaning increases in free testosterone when they do blood analysis. The other compound that's relevant both to men and women, or I should say people that are trying to optimize testosterone and or estrogen, is Fidogia. Fidogia agrestis is a actually an herb that increases the levels of what's called luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone is a hormone that's released from the hypothalamus within the brain that travels to the gonads, either the ovaries or the testes, to stimulate the release of estrogen or testosterone. And Fidogia agrestis has been shown, albeit in a limited number of studies, to increase levels of luteinizing hormone and thereby levels of testosterone and estrogen in ways that while there are supplements that can help boost your testosterone levels, it is important to seek medical advice from qualified personnel. One such supplement is Tongkak Ali, a type of ginseng that is shown to increase free testosterone levels in some individuals. And the second one is Fadogia agrestis, a herb that has been shown to increase luteinizing hormone levels. And what does increasing luteinizing hormones do to the body? Luteinizing hormone, or LH, is a hormone secreted by the pituitary glands that plays a critical role in the reproductive system of both males and females. In males, LH stimulates the Leydig cells in the testes to produce testosterone, while in females, LH triggers ovulation and the formation of the corpus luteum. 
Increased levels of LH can have different effects on the body, depending on the context. In men, High levels of LH may indicate a problem with the testes or pituitary gland and can lead to low testosterone levels and reduced fertility. In women, high levels of LH are often associated with polycystic ovary syndrome, or PCOS, a condition that can lead to irregular menstrual cycles, infertility, and other health problems. All these boil down to proper hormone optimization and taking effective strategies and practices to boost your body metabolism and nutrient utilization. But what are some of these practices? A key aspect to the midday meal, if you want that meal to benefit you, is to take a brief walk afterwards. It turns out that brief walks of 5 to 30 minutes after ingesting food can accelerate metabolism and actually can accelerate and improve nutrient utilization, which is essentially the same as metabolism. But nonetheless, that's something that I do after I finish my noon meal. I do force myself to stand up and go outside and take a brief walk. That also gets me again into optic flow. It also has another benefit, which is that I am giving my brain and thereby my body more information about light and time of day, which is always better than less information about light and time of day. Much of our circadian rhythm and our health rhythms and all of our cognitive rhythms, et cetera, are supported by our cells knowing where they are in time. And light is the primary Zeitgeber, that's German for timekeeper. Taking a walk after a meal can help nutrient utilization and metabolism in several ways. First, physical activity can increase blood flow to the digestive system, enhancing nutrient delivery to the body's cells. Second, walking can help stimulate the digestive process, allowing the body to break down and absorb nutrients from food more efficiently. Third, walking can help regulate your circadian rhythm exposing the eyes to sunlight and triggering our brain to know what processes to commence and what not to do. So all the occasional brief walks, early morning walks, and evening strolls play a highly important role in metabolism and nutrient utilization. It are beneficial for all the organs and tissues of the body to optimize hormonal functions in the body properly. But after the whole day's stress, it's important to appreciate the power of proper rest. Managing stress is vital, and having enough rest is optimal for proper body function and hormonal balance. Let's see some science-supported protocols to do so. An ability to control your levels of stress in real time is extremely powerful. It turns out you can do this using physiology and neuroscience. Your breathing can directly impact your heart rate and your level of stress or calm. Here's how it works. When you inhale, your diaphragm moves down. This creates more space in your thoracic cavity and your heart actually gets a little bit bigger. As a consequence, the rate of blood flow through that larger heart volume slows down. A signal is sent from a group of neurons on your heart called the sinoatrial node. That signal goes up to the brain, and your brain sends a signal to speed the heart up. In other words, inhaling speeds your heart rate up. The opposite is true as well. When you exhale, your diaphragm moves up. Your heart gets a little bit smaller because there's a little bit less space in your thoracic cavity. As a consequence, blood flows more quickly through that smaller volume. The sinoatrial node registers that and sends a signal to your brain, and the brain sends a signal to slow the heart down. So in other words, inhaling speeds your heart rate up, exhaling slows your heart rate down. So if you want to speed up your heart rate and be more alert, inhale more or make those inhales more vigorous, more intense. If you want to calm down, You can do that quickly by making your exhales slightly longer than your inhales or making them more vigorous. This doesn't require any breath work. This is something that you can do in real time. And that's what's called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. When stressed, our body's natural fight or flight response is activated, which can cause our breathing to become shallow and rapid. This, in turn, can lead to an increase in feelings of anxiety and stress. By practicing deep breathing exercises, we can counteract this response and help our body to relax. Inhaling deeply through your nose and exhaling slowly through your mouth can help you slow your breathing and reduce your heart rate, promoting relaxation and reducing feelings of stress. Deep breathing also helps bring more oxygen to the body, which can help calm the mind and reduce muscle tension. You can try many different breathing exercises, including the alternate nostril, box, and diaphragmatic breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing can lead to an increase in respiratory sinus arrhythmia, or RSA, which, as explained by Andrew Huberman, is a natural psychological response that occurs during normal breathing. 
These exercises can be practiced anywhere, at any time, and can be a quick and easy way to reduce feelings of stress and anxiety. Overall, practicing deep breathing exercises can effectively alleviate stress and promote relaxation in both the mind and body, thereby causing an effective optimization of hormones and boosting testosterone in the process. Thanks for watching! Did you like this video? Then show your support by subscribing, ringing the bell, and enabling notifications to never miss videos like this. Thank you.